We all know the entire Assassin's Creed series is quite massive. It spans many video games, spin-offs, books and many other forms of media. Of course with that many Assassin's Creed things there are, there's bound to be so many memorable moments that Assassin's Creed has. These could be the complete highs all the way to the lows, which is why in this video I'll go over my most memorable moments in Assassin's Creed in order. Of course this entire video is my opinion and you will definitely have a different order selection to me. So yeah, without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Okay so first off in this video is something that you may not have expected to see. I've included something that is often quite brushed to the side and I don't really see many people talk about this and that is being able to explore Edward Kenway's London mansion in Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Now of course, we don't actually get to play or see Edward Kenway during his time living in this house but just knowing that this house once belonged to him is great to know. This part of the game in Assassin's Creed Syndicate kind of stuck with me. It's even better knowing that his memories and artifacts are all stored in this house and we can actually see them. There's a miniature version of the Jackdaw which is the iconic ship that we took over in Black Flag which unfortunately sunk. In fact we can actually see the shipwreck in Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry. There's also strangely the Morrigan ship from Assassin's Creed Rogue which I don't really understand how or why that's even there. We can also see the pistols that Woods Rogers gave Edward Kenway when we met him in Black Flag. There's also the crystal cube that Edward Kenway was in possession with. There's also Captain Blackbeard's hat just chilling on the table I guess. Also a map of the Caribbean in game. And lastly my personal favourite, if we go under the mansion through a secret entrance, we're able to see the actual helm of the Jackdaw itself. So yeah, it's pretty amazing that we're able to see all of this stuff. Especially knowing that these are mementos and artefacts from Edward Kenway's time as a pirate. Now of course you can only view the stuff that's under the mansion during one of Evie Fry's missions. If you try visiting Edward Kenway's mansion after the game, correct me if I'm wrong but I don't believe you're able to go under the mansion anymore. Next up for my 17th most memorable moment in Assassin's Creed and that is when Desmond returned to Abstergo in Assassin's Creed 3. Just seeing the way Desmond uses his assassin like skills just taking out enemies one by one is quite something. So having fought his way through the structure we see the confrontation with Warren Village along with his father being held at gunpoint. This scene just shows how much of a badass Desmond truly is because he doesn't really say much. He just takes control of everyone using the apple, compelling Vidich to turn his own gun against himself. Warren Vidich's death in this scene to me is quite memorable as it does not just impact the loss for the Templars but it also gives Desmond a deep personal victory of his own. The whole anticipation from Assassin's Creed 1 up until 3 was built quite a lot when it came to Warren Vidich himself. However the face off that he had against Daniel Cross may have seemed a little mundane as the game just presents this scene like he's an irrelevant side character when he really wasn't. You see given that Village is a pretty smart guy, Ubisoft then decided to introduce Daniel Cross into the mix as another villain against Desmond. In fact Daniel Cross is in the comics which I recommend reading if you want to know more lore on Assassin's Creed. However in the game Daniel Cross isn't really explained in much detail and little is known of him. Nevertheless though I've still decided to feature Desmond's return to Abstergo as one of the standout and most memorable moments for me for all the reasons I've just elaborated on. Dad? Not so fast Mr. Miles. In case you hadn't noticed, I'm the one calling the shots. Now give me the apple. You want it? Fine. Wait! No! You never should have come here. You put everything on the line. For what? So you could rescue your father? Yeah.
Now let's move on to a memorable moment in Assassin's Creed Unity. This one to me is quite underrated and that is the Pierre Bellic fight. Now Pierre Bellic as a character was one that I liked quite a lot, even if he was a quote unquote traitor in the end. Despite him constantly calling Arno a pisspot, it was quite upsetting knowing that we had to kill him. Despite Assassin's Creed Unity not really having any memorable story moments, the fight itself with Bellic is definitely memorable. It set atop a cathedral in the midst of a storm, and with the added dialogue throughout the combat, the encounter turned into a more enjoyable and satisfying fight. The whole idea of clashing swords with your own mentor made this fight feel all the more memorable and close-hearted. It was definitely something that, in my opinion, added a somewhat heartfelt aspect that was missing from the rest of the story in the game. Bellic's lack of open-mindedness struck at the core of the assassin philosophy, where the saying is that nothing is true. He directly violated the third tenet by assassinating Mirabau. His actions not only compromised the brotherhood but potentially resulted in the loss of innocent lives, which therefore also infringed upon the first tenet as well. I feel as if Bellic was a character that should have been utilised a lot more. To me, he just falls into the category of wasted potential, which is something Ubisoft is quite good at doing, creating wasted potential moments in characters. Do it. If you've got an ounce of conviction, then you don't use the love out of milk sop. You kill me now. Because I won't stop. Well, killer. Save the Brotherhood. I'd see Paris burn. I know. Finish it! Thank you, my friend. Gotta get you back to that boy here so we're in peace. Don't we, piss pot? Drop this. Well... I'll be damned. So you're really going through with this? Your protege vouches for her. Don't you trust him? With my life, it's the girl I don't trust. Nothing I can say to convince you. I'm afraid not. Thought not. Chin. Chin. I pause on pay. I pause on pay. Assassin's Creed Black Flag had so many characters that we met throughout the game, but unfortunately a lot of them just got killed off. One of these characters is Mary Reed, or as she's commonly known as James Kidd. She was a character that definitely had a very, very interesting and mysterious side to her. In fact, she was one of my favourite side characters in Assassin's Creed Black Flag, alongside Blackbeard. Her character as a whole was just amazing. She understood Edward Kenway a lot longer before he did himself, and saw through his facade. She was practically the guiding and supporting voice, always pushing Edward to do better. That's why when she died in Assassin's Creed Black Flag, it was definitely a moment that stuck with me for quite a while. The scene during the prison escape hits hard emotionally. You can practically feel Edward's heart shattering in that instance. As he reaches the boat with Mary and then at to buy, questions his next move. Edward responds with a resigned, nothing sensible. Mary's death marks that very pivotal moment in Edward's journey. The moment that he realises the need for personal growth and change. This realisation is not just for his own sake, but also as a tribute to her memory. So yeah, overall this moment in the game was quite a memorable one. It's one of those moments where Ubisoft just tries to break you by implementing such an emotional death in the series. Don't die on my account. Go. This is such a pain in the ass. Damn it. 
You should have been the one to outlast me. I've done my part. Will you? If you came with me, I could. Mary. I'll be with you, can we? I will. to Mary. What's wrong? Is she gone? Oh, no. Oh, God! Oh. What will you do now? Nothing sensible. You haven't earned this, but they suit you. Good fortune to you, Edward Kenway. Moving on, I've chosen a memorable part of Assassin's Creed that's not actually in the games but rather a short animated film, and that is the ending of Assassin's Creed Embers. If you watch this then you definitely know what I'm talking about, and that is the conclusion to Ezio's story and witnessing his official death. This is definitely something that's memorable as it hits you right in the feels. We quite literally witnessed the entire life of Ezio, and that's not even an exaggeration. We get to control his little hands and feet as a newborn baby in Assassin's Creed 2, and then at the end we can see him at a very old age die peacefully on a bench in Florence with his family around. It was a very bittersweet moment. We can see Ezio take one last relieved look at his wife and daughter and just peacefully pass away. Well I say peacefully but the canon explanation is a heart attack, but to be honest it did look quite peaceful. I did notice the quite interesting hidden feature that they added where they showcased a young teenager sitting next to Ezio and complaining about the city having no beautiful women. Of course I'm pretty sure this is to showcase when Ezio was young and the teenager on the bench is meant to be what a younger Ezio was like. So yeah, the ending of Assassin's Creed Embers is something that will stick with me for a very long time because Ezio Auditore to me is a personal favourite character of mine and that's not just in Assassin's Creed but in any video game and being able to witness his conclusion is rather satisfying but also heartbreaking. Al diavolo, I hate this damn city. I wish I was in Rome. I hear the women there are... hmm like ripe Sangiovese on the vine, you know? Not like here, Firenze. <laughs> I don't think Firenze is your problem. Prego? <coughs> Coraggio, vecchio. Get some rest, huh? <sighs> <sighs> When I was a young man, I had liberty, but I did not see it. I had time, but I did not know it. And I had love, but I did not feel it. Many decades would pass before I understood the meaning of all three. And now, in the twilight of my life, 
This understanding has passed into containment. Love, liberty, and time, once so disposable, are the fuels that drive me forward. And love, most especially, mio caro. For you, our children, our brothers and sisters, and for the vast and wonderful world that gave us life and keeps us guessing. Endless affection, mio Sofia. Forever yours, Ezio Auditore. Maxwell Wrath to me is a villain that is by far more memorable and entertaining than Crawford Staric. Wrath practically embodied what a villain is supposed to be like, and he ranks quite up there in the entire Assassin's Creed series when it comes to the bad guys. He was a character that was quite similar to the Joker, and was a complete lunatic that lost his mind. He derived pleasure from simply causing pain to others. I believe that if his storyline had come about earlier and if there had been more interactions and conflicts between him and Jacob, it would have been a fantastic narrative choice. To me, just having one single sequence just felt like wasted potential. His character deserved a lot more development and screen time. He brought this very distinctive charisma to a game that, to me, the story was rather flat. When it came to his death, however, now that was portrayed very well, which is what makes it so memorable for me. The entire sequence holds its own charm, as he engulfs the theatre in flames, which is then accompanied by his delusional rants blasting at full volume through the theatre's speakers. The entire monologue that he gave was very, very entertaining, and it added to his character so much more. <laughs> I hope you have enjoyed your evening so far, ladies and gentlemen. I know I have. Now, before our final act, I would like to toast all you brave people who joined us tonight to celebrate life and death. Go on, toast them! <laughs> Your move, Jacob, my dear! Burn! 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 <clears throat> Darling, what a night. The stuff of legends. Why did you do it? All of it. What? Snap a baby crow's neck between my thumb and forefinger. Slice to bits the ones you deem innocent. Keep the world in its divine, manic state. For the same reason, I do anything. Why not? <laughs> This one is quite an unusual one to me. The reason I say this is because Yusuf in Assassin's Creed Revelations was a character that of course we all liked a lot. He was an assassin that was charming, entertaining and just an overall great person. But he unfortunately ends up getting killed off and it's unusual because Ubisoft decided to present him with an off screen death which is very disappointing and Yusuf to me was a character that I connected with quite well. He was definitely a memorable one to say the least. We see Ezio travel to Cappadocia and obtain one of Altair's keys, and then when he returns, he discovers the lifeless body of Yusuf inside Sophia's establishment. This was a game-defining moment that impacted both Ezio and also the Ottoman Brotherhood of Assassins. The speech Ezio gives after is quite touching, and it also encourages all of the assassins to rise above this and overcome their leader's death. Oh, and of course, how could I forget about the most iconic and game-defining moment in Assassin's Creed Revelations that changed pretty much everything, the hook blade. Huh? You have earned your rest, brother. Requiescat in pace. Oh. 
Brothers, sisters, the whole city rises against us, while Yusuf's murderer waits and watches from the arsenal, laughing. Fight with me, and show him what it means to cross the assassins. Moving on to Assassin's Creed 2, a game that has quite a lot of memorable moments. In fact, I would like to think that this game has the most amount of memorable moments in the franchise. The one I've included is the Rodrigo Borgia fight. Now the reason it's so memorable to me is because of how iconic it is. I mean, you are quite literally fist fighting the Pope himself. Now of course, if you don't know, Rodrigo Borgia in game is meant to be Pope Alexander VI in real life. Now on top of us fist fighting the Pope, Another reason I think that this is so memorable to me is because of its impact and how it affects the entire story of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. It's a rather anticlimactic boss fight because in the end, instead of assassinating and killing Rodrigo, Ezio decides to spear him, which of course would be considered not the right move. I mean yeah, you could say Ezio matured and saw a bigger purpose, which is why he spared him. But to me, Rodrigo is a Templar. A person with a ton of power, a person that was responsible for the death of your father and your brothers. He should have just ended his life at the end of Assassin's Creed 2. I think the most logical reason I could think of for this is because of historical accuracy. Rodrigo Borgia in real life did not die in 1499 and had about 4 years left. So Ubisoft opted to just follow that along. We see that in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, this had a lasting impact as we would then see the death of Mario Aditore and a lot of other bad events occurring. So yeah, the fight itself however is quite memorable and it's why I've included it in this video. Open damn you! Open! It's over, Rodrigo. No more tricks. No more ancient artifacts. No more weapons. Let us see what you are made of, old man. Alright then, if that's how you want to play it. What do you even want with the vault, Rodrigo? Don't you know what lies within? Or do you mean to tell me the great and powerful assassins didn't figure it out? Figure what out? God. It's God that dwells within. You expect me to believe that God lives beneath Il Vaticano? A more logical location than a kingdom in a cloud, don't you think? Surrounded by singing angels and cherubim makes for a lovely image. But the truth is far more interesting. Let's say I was to believe you. What do you think you'll do when you open that door? I don't care. It's not approval I'm after. Just power. And you think you'll give it up? Whatever lies beyond that wall won't be able to resist the staff and apple. They were made for felling gods. God is meant to be all-knowing, all-powerful. You think a couple of ancient relics can harm him? You know nothing, boy. You take your image of the creators from an ancient book. A book, mind you, written by men. You are the Pope, and yet you dismiss the central text of your faith? Are you so naive? I became Pope because it gave me access. It gave me power. Do you think I believe a single goddamn word of that ridiculous book? It's all lies and superstition, just like every other religious tract written over the past 10,000 years. Pace. 
Ezio Auditore in Assassin's Creed 2 had a lot of memorable moments. And one that sticks out that I can recall is the speech that he gives during the bonfire of Vanity's quest. This scene really stuck with me for quite a long time as it shows Ezio's more mature and serious side. It shows how great of a speaker he is. The speech he gives effectively highlights his past 22 years and all the things he had to go through and overcome. It's definitely a moment that showcases his growth from the very beginning of the game where we see him flirting and fist fighting Vieri's posse to now a fully fledged assassin with a path ahead of him. The speech shows the maturity of his development and his acknowledgement of being an assassin. What's really cool is how he's now trying to lead and shape a better world using the wisdom that he's gained from his experiences. And this speech captures this essence and it highlights how much he's changed. Silencio! Silencio! 22 years ago, I stood where I stand now and watched my loved ones die. Betrayed by those I had called friends. Vengeance clouded my mind. It would have consumed me were it not for the wisdom of a few strangers who taught me to look past my instincts. They never preached answers, but guided me to learn from myself. We don't need anyone to tell us what to do. Not Savonarola, not the Merici. We are free to follow our own path. There are those who will take that freedom from us. Too many of you gladly give it. But it is our ability to choose whatever you think is true that makes us human. There is no book or teacher to give you the answers show you the path. Choose your own way. Do not follow me or anyone else. Now this is a moment in Assassin's Creed that I'm sure at the time of it happening made us all shocked. We could clearly see that a relationship was starting to form between Desmond and Lucy from the very beginning until Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. So the fact that at the end of Brotherhood we see the death of Lucy was quite a shocking sight to see. It's one of the biggest cliffhangers in the entire Assassin's Creed games at the time. So after Desmond acquires the Apple of Eden, we can then see that Desmond is suddenly not able to move his own limbs and slowly approaches Lucy and stabs her in the stomach. Ubisoft are pretty cruel just to straight up end the potential relationship between Desmond and Lucy, but I guess it had to be done. Her death is explained however in the DLC in which Lucy was involved in a secret project called Siren, where she was an undercover Templar all along, which then forced Juno to compel Desmond to kill her, blah blah. But let's be honest, nobody's believing that. We know that Kristen Bell, who is Lucy's actress, had a falling out with Ubisoft and demanded royalties for her role. So unfortunately they just had to kill Lucy's character off. Nevertheless though this doesn't take away from how memorable this death scene actually was. You know thinking about it now I just wish the modern day segments of Assassin's Creed were as good as they were back then. You sure you asked it the right thing? I know this, I know that symbol. That, that's a Phrygian cap. It stands for freedom and that, that's a Masonic eye. Now those two come together in only one place. What's that? I, I can't move. Your DNA communes with the apple. You have activated it. Uh, let me go! On the 72nd day before the moment of awakening, you, birth from our loins and the loins of our enemies, the end and the beginning, who we abhor and honor, the final journey commences. There is one who would accompany you through the gate. She lies not within our sight. The cross darkens the horizon. What are you doing? The path must be opened. You cannot escape your part in this. The scales shall be balanced.
Stop! Please! You know very little. We must guide you. Cease your struggle. No! It is done. The way lies all before you. Only she remains to be found. Awaken the Sixth. Go, alone! Now we're slowly moving on to the more and more memorable moments. And after Lucy's death in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, I've gone with something that is actually the most memorable scene to me in Assassin's Creed 3, and that is witnessing Haytham's death at the hands of Connor. Haytham was a character to me that felt like the best part of Assassin's Creed 3, and typical Ubisoft. That's, once again, another wasted potential right there. I feel as if the limelight for Haytham deserves to be shown. I need and I want a game that's focused on primarily Haytham Kenway, because I know that it's not just me, but whenever he appeared in the game, he often stole the show. Anyway, for his death though in Assassin's Creed 3, I will admit that they did do this quite well, and it is very memorable. It runs off the storyline between Connor and Haytham, and they face each other as equals. It's one of the more heartfelt moments in Assassin's Creed. We can see both sides of the Templars and Assassins, and the way that they were detailed during the scene was done quite efficiently. The death of Haytham was a very good way to round off Assassin's Creed 3. It was emotionally damaging, very meaningful, and it also was very memorable. What adds an extra layer of sadness to Haytham's death is that Connor felt remorse for killing Haytham. You see, after going through Haytham's journal, he came to see that there may have been a chance for them to find common ground. I even think you can see Connor write I made a mistake in his native language on the assassination wall if I'm not mistaken. Where are you, Charles? Gone. Come now, you cannot hope to match me, Connor. With all your skills, you are still but a boy, with so much left to learn. Give me Lee! Impossible. He is the promise of a better future. The sheep need a shepherd. He has been dismissed and censured. He can do nothing for you now. A temporary setback. He will be restored. Uh, to declare me and mine wrong for the world. Uh, and yet everything I've shown you, all I've said and done, should clearly demonstrate otherwise. We did not... Support the crown! We work to see this land united and at peace. Under our rule, all would be equal. Do the Patriots promise the same? They offer freedom, which I've told you time and time again is dangerous. There will never be consensus, son, amongst those you have helped to ascend. They will each differ in their views of what it means to be free. The peace you so desperately seek does not exist. No! Ah! Together they will forge something new. Ah! Better than what came before. These men are united now by a common cause. Ah! But when this battle is finished, they will fall to fighting amongst themselves about how best to ensure control. In time... It will lead to war. You will see. The Patriot leaders do not seek control. There will be no monarch here. The people will have the power, as they should. The people never have the power. Only the illusion of it. And here's the real secret. They don't want it. The responsibility is too great to bear. 
It's why they're so quick to fall in line as soon as someone takes charge. They want to be told what to do. They yearn for it. Little wonder that, since all mankind was built to serve. Surrender, and I will spare you. Brave words from a man about to die. Uh, you fare no better. <laughs> Even when your kind appears to triumph, still we rise again. And do you know why? It's because the Order is born of a realization. We require no creed, no indoctrination by desperate old men. All we need is that the world be as it is. This is why the Templars will never be destroyed. Don't think I have any intention of caressing your cheek and saying I was wrong. I will not weep and wonder what might have been. I'm sure you understand. Still, I'm proud of you in a way. You have shown great conviction, strength, courage, all noble qualities. I should have killed you long ago. Wanna give you what you're not getting? In Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, there's one particular individual that is always a pain in our ass, and that is Cesare Borgia. So when we finally come face to face with him on the wall and throw him off it, it's one of the most satisfying Templar kills in the series. It's a pretty funny one too because Cesare himself says that no man can kill him, so Ezio just drops him off the wall and he falls to his death. It's such a memorable moment because through our brotherhood, we chase Cesare hoping to finally catch up to him, and eventually we finally do. Unlike the Rodrigo fight in Assassin's Creed 2 where we used our fists, Cesare's boss fight was a lot more to it and held much more intensity. The boss fight itself however is rather straightforward, you just defeat his guards wave after wave and then break his armour piece by piece until he is no more. So yeah, the Cesare fight to me is very memorable because it's also very iconic. It marked the culmination of a very good story where Ezio finally eliminates the thorn that's in his backside. Oh and he's also into incest so that's another reason to take him out. The throne was mine! Wanting something does not make it your right. What do you know? That a true leader empowers the people he rules. I will lead mankind into a new world. Che nessuno ricordi il tuo nome. Requiescat in pace. You cannot kill me. No man can murder me! Then I leave you in the hands of fate. This is a personal favourite of mine. A lot of people may not see this as memorable because it's a blah blah RPG game blah blah. But if you put that aside, it's a very important memorable scene for the lore of the series. So at the end of Origins, we witness the birth of the early version of the Brotherhood. This is a moment that is very key to the Assassins as it pretty much formed from this point. However, this moment is bittersweet as the founders Baik and Aya must set aside their romantic love for each other to fully embrace their new roles as hidden ones. This scene powerfully exemplifies how being an assassin often demands sacrifices more vividly than any other instance in the game. Our victories have multiplied, our bond not so. We could never have been. Everything has told us our love is impossible. You are right. 
Something bigger has called us. But our love lives in the Duat. Only now we are letting go. Let the gods decide. The gods are dead. We must sacrifice our personal lives for the greater good. All this darkness was for a reason. I was wrong to be so reckless in public without killing. We must work in the shadows. Egypt has fallen. Greece also. And Rome will fall too. All will fall to the creed, yet no one will know. When we assassinate, we assassinate only those who deserve it. The few sick souls who try to control us. But they will never know who we are. Cold, calculated, poets of the kin. I am fine with this. I am not a father anymore. I am not a husband. I am not a Magi. I am a hidden one. Yes. We are the hidden ones. We sharpen our blades and pull what hope is left from this foul earth. Old Bayek of Siwa. What are you of now? A new creed. Ours is finished. From the very beginning of the franchise in Assassin's Creed 1, all the way up until Assassin's Creed Mirage, one hallmark feature that constantly defines the franchise is the iconic leap of faith. This insane looking dive from Grace High serves as the series signature move. This leap of faith ignited one of the most recognisable mechanics in the series. Doing the leap of faith itself has become the subject of jokes, and it's often sparked scientific debates about its feasibility, solidifying itself as the moment that truly hooked many people onto the series. So, in Assassin's Creed 1, the assassins must prove that they do not fear death, so Al Mualim sends them to do a leap of faith by jumping off a tower into a haystack. This is where we see the very first leap of faith with Altair. I remember seeing this for the very first time and I was confused at what just happened. I mean, just think about it. I was a child at the time and I had just jumped off a tower and landed safely. I had no idea what was even happening. Of course now we see the leap of faith in pretty much every Assassin's Creed game and it's just a staple for the series. It's probably the most recognizable feature about Assassin's Creed. Heretic! Return what you have stolen from me! You've no claim to it, Robert. Take yourself from here before I'm forced to thin your ranks further. You play a dangerous game! I assure you, this is no game. So be it! Bring forth the hostage! Your village lays in ruins, and your stores are hardly endless! How long before your fortress crumbles from within? How disciplined will your men remain when the wells run dry and their food is gone? My men do not fear death, Robert. They welcome it, and the rewards it brings. Good! Then they shall have it all around! Follow me, and do so without hesitation. Show this fool knight what it is to have no fear. Go to God! Assassin's Creed Black Flag had a lot of memorable moments. There's Mary Reed's death, Blackbeard's death, and the deaths of a lot of side characters. But there's one memorable scene to me that sticks out the most, and that is the ending of the game. This was one of the most memorable endings for any Assassin's Creed game. It was just simply heartfelt and emotional. 
We can see Edward Kenway at the time fulfill his goals, but unfortunately at the cost of losing a lot of friends. Which is why Anne Bonny begins to sing, making it even more emotional. This scene shows all of the companions Edward knew and unfortunately did not survive as he walks to meet his daughter for the very first time. This was the perfect wrap up for the story and it solidified the notion that Edward Kenway has truly changed for the better. The choice of music throughout this moment masterfully complements the ambience of the scene. It's just simply a beautiful moment that is etched into my memory. If this video was not about the most memorable moments in Assassin's Creed, but rather the most shocking moments, this could easily be at the top spot. And that is Desmond's death in Assassin's Creed 3. Desmond Mars was a character that was the main modern day character in every Assassin's Creed game from Assassin's Creed 1 up until 3. So seeing him sacrifice himself to liberate Juno at the end of Assassin's Creed 3 was quite a memorable moment in the series. It was a moment that where at the time we all wondered what would happen after Assassin's Creed 3 seeing as Desmond was dead. Of course we now know how that went and now the modern day is very very well let's just say underwhelming. I mean I guess he's somewhat alive as a bright light bulb in Valhalla but to me that doesn't count. I just wish we had a modern day character that was on the level of Desmond again. Leila Hassan was okay but I guess she was just plopped into the game without any meaning or lore behind her. So yeah, Desmond's death for me is a very top contender for the most memorable moments in Assassin's Creed. If you heed Minerva, the sun will have its way. The ground will crack and spit fire into the skies. All the world will burn. But this does not end the world, merely heralds its arrival. Darkness follows. Then you emerge, resolving to lay a foundation that such a tragedy does not befall the world again. You will become a symbol to those who survive. Hope, knowledge, determination. You will inspire them to rebuild, to thrive once more. And as the world heals, so too will humanity. But you are just a man. Frail and mortal, you pass from the world, leaving behind only a memory, a legacy. You will be remembered first as a hero, later as a legend, and in time as a god. It is the cruelest fate to have written words that meant well and see them made wicked and unwise. What was meant to encourage life, used instead to justify taking it. And so now you see that what was shall be again. So tell me, how is this better? She would sacrifice you, sacrifice the world, for no other reason than to deny me vindication. They will enslave your kind, Desmond. Is this not why you fight? Is this not why you came here? To ensure more than just your race's future, but its freedom? What future? What freedom? Billions dead and the whole cycle begun anew? This world has known nothing but heartache and horror since we left it. Our gift to them, and you'd see it all returned. Enough! You 
must not do this. Whatever Juno's planning, however terrible it might seem today, we'll find a way to stop it. But the alternative, what you want, there's no hope there. If you free her, you'll be destroyed. It will happen in an instant. There will be no pain. You mustn't. It's done, Minerva. The decision's made. Then the consequences of this mistake are yours to live and to die with. You need to go. All of you. Now. Get as far away from here as you can. Come with us. We'll find another way. There isn't time. Son. You know it's true. It's already started. I need to do this now. So go. Go! Alright, so, Assassin's Creed Revelations is filled with numerous great moments. We get to witness the relationship with Sophia and Ezio, we see the Ottoman assassins rise, and we also get to take out Prince Ahmed. But the end of the game is where it's most memorable. Ubisoft had a hard task at hand to conclude the story of Ezio Auditore, and they did so in very memorable fashion. We witness Ezio uncover Altair's skeletal remains, as well as witnessing the final moments of Altair himself, who we can see is a very aged man. Ezio's monologue as he comes to terms with the importance of his life is exceptionally well done. It honestly gave me goosebumps just seeing Ezio and Altair in the same room together and how both characters' stories ended. Then there's the Desmond part, where we can see Ezio extend his hand to touch Desmond and even mention his name. Overall, the Masyaf library scene at the end of Assassin's Creed Revelations is probably the most memorable moment in Assassin's Creed, alongside my number one spot. No books. No wisdom, just you, fratello mio. Requiescat in pace, Altair. Another artifact. No. You will stay here. I have seen enough for one life. Desmond? He's talking to me? I heard your name once before, Desmond. A long time ago. And now it lingers in my mind, like an image from an old dream. I do not know where you are, or by what means you can hear me. But I know you are listening. I have lived my life as best I could, not knowing its purpose but drawn forward like a moth to a distant moon. And here at last, I discover a strange truth. That I am only a conduit for a message that eludes my understanding. Who are we, who have been so blessed to share our stories like this? To speak across centuries? Maybe you will answer all the questions I have asked. Maybe you will be the one to make all this suffering worth something in the end. Now, listen. So here we are. This is my number one spot and my most memorable moment in the entire Assassin's Creed series. And that is the very start of Assassin's Creed 2, where we see Ezio and his brother on a rooftop. Now yes, don't get me wrong, this scene isn't the most flashy or action-packed, 
but it's one that holds such immense weight. It defines the story of Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood and even Revelations. We witness Ezio's journey at the start of Assassin's Creed 2 as nothing out of the ordinary. We had no idea at that time that his entire world would be flipped upside down and that he lived the life of an assassin. So we see Ezio and his brother race across the streets and even the rooftops until they get to the church. And from here is where the phrase, it is a good life we lead brother, is formed. This to me is one of the best openings in any video game and it's arguably the most memorable. It's crazy to think that after this moment, Ezio's life would not be the same ever again and his brother on the rooftop next to him would be hanged just days later. It may not be the most iconic moment as I'd probably give that to the end of Assassin's Creed Revelations but to me it's definitely the most memorable. It is a good life we lead brother. <sighs> best may it never change and may it never change us so there you have it those are my most memorable moments in assassin's creed i tried not to miss out anything but knowing me i definitely missed out on one or two things but overall i'm happy with what i've chosen of course this is my personal opinion and you may have a list that's entirely different to mine. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button and drop a like. And with that said, I'll see you in the next one.